right, welcome everyone to this midweek teaching. And I'm just going to let you know in advance that I did record a series, a three-part series, on reviewing the understanding, if you will, of the Trinity. And of course, we know that this is a touchy subject. That being said, prior to releasing those videos, which are already recorded, little side note, that's why in a couple of them, I'll still have longer hair, <laughs> okay? I wanted to review the creeds prior to releasing those videos because the way the Trinity is taught in most Sunday buildings is based on the Athanasian Creed. And most of the times when I mention the Athanasian Creed, a good portion of Christians say, I've never heard of that creed or I'm not familiar with that creed. They tend to be familiar with the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. However, in the Apostles' Creed nor in the Nicene Creed do they teach the Trinity the way it is typically taught and preached about in the Sunday buildings. The Sunday buildings tell you the whole three and one, one and three, three as unity, unity as three, and three is still one, right? That type of thing. But the Apostles' Creed never says the word Trinity, nor does the Nicene Creed. So, the Bible doesn't mention the word Trinity, neither does the Apostles' Creed, and neither does the Nicene Creed. The creed that mentions that kind of understanding of the Trinity is the Athanasian Creed. And interestingly enough, it's the only one that most Christians seem to not really be familiar with. All right. And that's why I'm calling this video Creeds of Confusion, because I'm going to suggest to you that how the Athanasian Creed reads out, which is essentially how you're being taught the Trinity in the sense of the relationship between the Father and the Son, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost, is very, very difficult to understand. That being said, that's the one they're preaching and teaching, the Athanasian Creed, not the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. And I'm going to suggest to you that that seems a bit disingenuous to me, because I think that once you read the Athanasian Creed, you will see how confusing indeed that it is. And I, again, I wanted to release this video prior to me releasing the three-part series on the Trinity. So, let's get to the creeds. And here we are, the Apostles' Creed. So, the first thing I want to note, by the way, um, that it's a Christian Reformed Church. We're going to use this site for all three creeds. And in this, folks, I want you to see, first of all, how short this is, okay? It's not very long at all, is it? Very short. Basically, three paragraphs. And I'm going to suggest to you very little, if, if almost nothing in this creed, I would suggest is not in scripture. It's very, very scriptural, this creed, it appears to me. So let's read it real quick. And it says this, I believe in God, the Father I might, oh, excuse me, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell, and I'm going to suggest to you this hell means Hades, the pit, the grave, right? Because, you know, sometimes that's a controversial subject in and of itself, but we'll continue. The third day he rose again from the dead, and he ascended to heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. A little pause for a moment. The one line I would probably adjust very, very slightly is he judges the living and the dead. In, in other words, present tense and continuing. And why? Well, Christians tend to always say, well, God is reigning through Christ right now. He is the King of Kings, right? So then why are you saying he's going to judge the living and the dead? I'm going to suggest to you that that should be present tense. However, with that said, I'm not offended. I'm just because where this kind of leans, I'm just suggesting where this leans is that he's going to have some kind of physical return onto the earth type of thing. And it doesn't really say that, but it kind of implies it due to the doctrines that have been taught in the Sunday buildings in the last, well, we'll just say 200 to 2000 years. <laughs> All right. So that's the only slight adjustment I do here. But again, no big deal. I believe in the Holy Spirit. And that's about all it says about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Catholic Church, and please keep in mind, Catholic means universal church, not Ro Roman Catholic Church. Catholic Church, this is, again, I'm going to remind you, Christian Reformed Church, okay? So, the Catholic Church 
is uh, in these creeds the universal Christian church. All right, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body. And it's fairly simple there, which I like because there could be some discussion whether it's a physical body or spiritual body, but they're not overly uh, dogmatic. They just say the resurrection of the body. That's good. And the life everlasting. Amen. So again, other than this one where I would go with a present tense on that, because if Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, as it says in the creed, then he must be reigning even now as we speak. And I think most Christians would be totally okay with that. Here's the thing. Did you once again notice, as I mentioned in the intro, that it never says the word Trinity? And it never says that they're three and one and one and three and they carry the same essences and you don't divide their persons and you keep them all together, but yet they're three, yet they're one and one and three because we have to say they're one even though they're three, but yet they're unified and all that stuff, right? That you're taught. It's not in the Apostles' Creed. So I don't mind saying, I, I don't mind this creed at all. With that said, I am going to mention this. Nothing in scripture really details out that we should be doing this, uh, confessing creeds. And if there is a disadvantage to any creed, in my opinion, is sometimes I think people get to the point that because they've kind of, you know, said this, that they're good, right? And I would suggest that people should go out of their way to make sure they understand that that's not the case. All right. Just repeating, right? Repeating something that someone tells you to repeat. That's, you know, it's doesn't have a whole lot of value, okay? But as for a creed, I say, okay, well, that's not terribly confusing and quite scriptural. I would suggest that you could find a lot of the, most of this in scripture. Well, Nicene Creed starts getting a little bit offside in my opinion, and I'm going to show you where. So first thing I want to note is, is that it's a little bit longer, isn't it? It's a little bit longer, but not tons, tons longer. But after reading the Apostles' Creed, it kind of makes me go, well, why do we even need this creed, right? But we'll read it anyways. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages. So you're seeing a little bit of an expansion, but so far, fairly scriptural from where I'm sitting. But then it says this, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. Now, this is where I would suggest, I don't know that we see this in scripture. So this, is must, this must be a positioning where they're kind of making some assessments. And again, I'm gonna note, they notice they don't say anything about a Trinity, right? They don't mention the word Trinity and they're kind of discussing, quite frankly, two, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. So maybe that's part of the reason why there's no word Trinity in here, but we'll continue. It says, begotten, not made, right? That again, appears to me to be an agenda. Like say he's begotten, why are you saying he's not made when a little bit further down, you say he was made human <laughs> right down there, right? So I kind of look at that and say, well, you're saying he's not made and I'm not really sure what you're getting at, but then just further down, you say he is made human. See, it's starting to get a little, in my opinion, convoluted, a little confusing and a little offside and a little outside of scripture. And if we're going to take the position that if we're going to make any kind of confession, it certainly should be found in scripture. Um, I'm wondering why they're adding this really and saying not made. It appears to me, I'm going to suggest strongly, this has to do more with some kind of agenda as opposed to um, genuine scriptural interpretation. And then it says of the same essence as the, of the, as the father, excuse me. And here's another word that was not found in the Apostles' Creed, but now it's here. And in the Greek, I believe this word is homoousius. And this was quite a straining word when they were talking about this back in 325 AD. Because again, this word, best to my knowledge, isn't even found in scripture. So now you're trying to declare that Jesus's essence is identical to the Father, and you have no direct scriptural evidence that that is indeed fully the case, and particularly when you're using a word that wasn't used in scripture. So for example, if you said that Jesus was the express image of the Father, that's 100% in scripture. But when you start dealing with essence, it, it's not a word that's in scripture, best to my knowledge. And this created a bit of an argument at the time. This was another part that was kind of getting a little shaky when they were having the big council meeting. And again, I'm going to suggest if it's not in scripture, then you're starting to get a little outside of scripture. And that to me could be potentially a problem. Through him, all things were made for us and for our salvation. Now I find that interesting and I don't mind saying, hey, um, you know, 
most of the time when I see a lot of Christians, particularly that are Calvinist Christians, they say that he made all things for his good will and purposes, right? And some of them are quite, you know, aggressive about it. <laughs> and so, but here it says, through him, all things were made for us. Oh, for us? I'm, I'm a little surprised that some of the Protestants aren't against that line right there. Hmm and for our salvation. But we'll continue. He came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made human. Okay. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again, according to the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory. So now it's he will come and with glory. So again, now they're intensifying what I think should be, you know, he judges the living and the dead present tense. Here they're saying he's going to come and that implies right? That it's future. But I'm going to suggest my position is his parousia, his return, right? Was at the end of the Mosaic age. So someone like myself will say, well, he, he actually returned in 70 AD, fulfilling all the law and the prophets, fulfilling all the old covenant so that we could be under the new covenant. So I'm not sure what you mean by coming, come again with glory because he's already seated at the right hand of the father. And they say, he's going to come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. Wait a minute. What do you mean will never end? He inaugurated the kingdom, didn't he? Didn't he start the spiritual kingdom? Is he not already king? Is he already not in that spiritual kingdom that does not come with observation? Is, is, is he not the king that's seated at the right hand of the father right now, far above all powers and principalities? When you say that his kingdom will never end, there's an implication there that his kingdom has not begun. But that's the spiritual kingdom that we all hope that when we're done our journeys here, we will be resurrected too, isn't it? You see some of the problems and this is creating confusion because I do know for a fact that a good portion of people I know do confess this creed and or and use this one as well as the Apostles Creed. But again, this is getting a little more offside in my opinion, okay? And kind of takes a person like me who sees the return of Christ within the generation he was in, because that's what he said, this generation shall not pass before all these things be fulfilled. And that he came to start that spiritual kingdom, you know, that comes without observation. So I believe he already completed the old age covenant, which was the Mosaic age covenant to usher in the new Christian age in the first century. But we'll continue. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. So again, I don't know that I've ever seen in scripture where it says the Lord, Holy Spirit, right? And now they're expanding the Holy Spirit here in the Apostles' Creed, going back a little bit. Um, it just says, I believe in the Holy Spirit. See that? Very simple, right? So in other words, I believe in the Father. I believe in Jesus, the Son, and I believe in the Holy Spirit. See, that's very simple. I don't think too many people in Christianity would have a problem with this. I know I don't, right? But then you come here and you start adding to it. Right? The giver of life. Well, isn't, you know, is, is the father the giver of life? I thought, they, or what's going on here? I thought the father through Christ, or is Christ, right? So we're starting to declare things that I think starts to get a little r rickety, if you will. He proceeds from the father and the son. And I'm going to remind everybody that and the son here on the east, the west agrees to this. The east does not. And I believe they mention that uh, on the right hand side here in this. Okay, they say he proceeds from the father on the east. Here, they say it's the father and the son. Still arguing about it, actually. And with the father and the son is worshiped and glorified. And so now here we have again, now we're worshiping the Holy Spirit and glorifying the Holy Spirit, right? Which we did not see in the Apostles' Creed. And I don't know that we can say for sure I see that anywhere in scripture, but we'll continue. He spoke through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic church again, um, Catholic meaning universal and apostolic church. We affirm one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead, right? And I'm going to suggest that again, that the resurrection that Jesus was saying was going to happen was at the end of the Mosaic age. And now we do not sleep. We go straight to what I call the judgment seat of Christ because no one comes to the father, but through Christ and to life in the world to come, which I would suggest really should say in the age to come, because that's the wording that's actually in the Greek. It's ages that are coming, not the world thing applies like a new earth or something like that in the sense of, you know, this one gets destroyed and he makes a new one. So 
as you can see, this one's starting to get a little off signed, um, expanding on things that were much simpler in the uh, Apostles' Creed. With that said, again, not seeing the word Trinity here. So I've proven that the word Trinity, we already know it's not in the Bible. We already know it's not in the Apostles' Creed. And now it's not in the Nicene Creed. Well, this isn't how they teach or preach the Trinity in the Sunday buildings. Dare I say it, the Orthodox boxes. And this is where I find this a little disingenuous. So I'm going to show you the actual creed that says Trinity and that the, the creed that they're actually teaching and preaching essentially, that most people don't realize this is where they're getting the Trinity words from, word from, excuse me. So again, same site, Christian Reformed, Athanasian Creed. So here we go. Whosoever or whoever desires to be saved should above all hold to the Catholic faith. Again, not Roman Catholic, universal Christian church faith. Anyone who does not keep it whole and unbroken will doubtlessly perish eternally. See, now right there, you know, it almost suggests to me that would you want to confess that, right? So is that, you know, I'm just suggesting, I don't know, conjecture on my part, but is that a, would you want to confess that as a big group, you know? <laughs> I don't know. It just seems a little, you know, dare I say it, a little threatening. Now, this is the Catholic faith, that we worship one God, and here's the words, finally, in Trinity and the Trinity in unity, okay? This is what they preach, and this is what they teach in the Sunday buildings in the Orthodox boxes. Neither blending their purses nor persons, excuse me, nor dividing their essence. And there's that word that they carried over from the Nicene Creed, and now they're including the word like persons. Persons? For God? Interesting. Don't find it in scripture. Um, they do say that Jesus, right, is the express image of the person of God. I think they mean like his character there, but uh, we'll continue. For the person of the Father is a distinct person. The person of the Son is another, and that of the Holy Spirit still another. But the divinity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is one. Their glory equal, their majesty co-eternal. Okay, hold on a second now. Now we're starting to really get things that we did not see in the Apostles' Creed nor the Nicene Creed. I'm going to take a real quick pause here and show you how long this creed is. Look at the difference now. See that? This is a juicy, juicy, juicy mama right here. <laughs> you know what I mean? I got a scroll on this one. This one does not fit on the screen. Okay? So you're going to get a lot of material out of this that is clearly not even possible to be in the Apostles' Creed nor the Nicene Creed. In fact, this creed is longer in its uh, state the way it is than if you put the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed together. All right? The quality the Father has, the Son has, and the Holy Spirit has. And so now we're starting to use His quality. You know, it's like, okay, where are we getting that out of Scripture? I'm going to suggest we really don't. They're starting to get even further outside of Scripture from where I'm sitting. Okay? Apostles' Creed, very simple. Here we go to the Nicene Creed. Now, it kind of started to get a little more out of bounds as far as I'm concerned. I'll let you make your own decision on that. And But now, we're getting even further out of the scriptural interpretations, if you will, that where you can go to a direct verse, right? The Father is uncreated. The Son is uncreated. The Holy Spirit is uncreated. The Father is immeasurable. The Son is immeasurable. The Holy Spirit is immeasurable, right? Okay, we... The Father is eternal, the Son is eternal, the Holy Spirit is eternal. So in each section, they list three, 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 and then here it comes. And yet, there are not three eternal beings. So they list three beings as being eternal, and then they go, and yet there's not three eternal beings. Do you see? This is where I go and I confirm my title. Creeds of Confusion. And why am I including all, including all of them? Well, because it seems to me like you evolved it, right? You started with, best as I know, something simple, and then you increased it. And then you really, really, really increased it and started adding a lot of things that, number one, I don't believe you can verify in scripture. And number two, that's confusing. And then he continues, it says, there is but one eternal being. So you list three, you say there's not three, there's one. See? And this is what they're preaching and teaching. That's my point. And that's why I'm a little surprised that most Christians don't really know about the Athanasian Creed because this is the one they're preaching and teaching. We'll continue. He goes, they go, so too, there are not three uncreated or immeasurable beings, right? Because they said there was three here and three here that were uncreated and or immeasurable. And then they go, there is but one uncreated and immeasurable being. See, this is the Trinity unity thing. 
Similarly, the Father is Almighty, the Son, Son is Almighty, the Holy Spirit is Almighty. Okay, they didn't say that in the Nicene Creed even, right? It says, the Father Almighty, right? I don't know if I recall, please feel free to go through. They never called the Son Almighty here. And I don't know that they called the Holy Spirit Almighty here. Isn't that interesting, right? But now, and I'll, please do double check me, but I'm pretty sure they don't. They say, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, right? That they apply Father and Almighty. You get to Athanasian Creed and they're applying the word Almighty to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then they follow that up with, yet there are not three almighty beings. <laughs> they're doing it again. There is but one almighty being. Now, I'm gonna, you're going to hear me say it in the recordings, but is it three or is it one? Well, according to them, it's both, <laughs> right? Thus, the Father is God. The son is God. And by the way, thus, it's like they, and therefore, kind of like they prove something. <laughs> it's like they got no chapters and verses on all of this, best as I can tell. But thus, the father is God. The son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. Yet there are not three gods. They're, they continue to do this, right? There is but one God. The father is Lord. The son is Lord. The Holy Spirit is Lord. Yet there are not three lords. There is but one Lord. See, this is what they're teaching. I keep repeating that to you. This is the one that they're teaching, right? So how come every Christian I know doesn't know this creed? Some of them, many of them don't even know the name of this one. They're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I'm like, that's the Trinity that they're teaching you. Oh, well, we, we do the Apostles' Creed. Yeah, it doesn't say Trinity in that. And some of them go, oh, well, we do the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. I go, yeah, neither one of those say, say Trinity, right? It's the Athanasian Creed that says Trinity and does the 3113. Just as Christian truth compels us to confess each person individually as both God and Lord, so Catholic religion forbids us to say that there are three gods or lords. Well, interestingly enough, you just said that there's <laughs> three gods, really, right? You said the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. And then you say, but it forbids us to say that there are three gods. <laughs> well, you just list, you're listing it yourself. <laughs> I mean, you have to admit, even if you agree with this, and I'm not trying to pick on the Trinitarians that go go with this, but you have to admit it's it's a little confusing and a little contradicting when you say you're not allowed to say three gods, but you just listed that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. And then you did the same thing with the word Lord. You said the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, the Holy Spirit is Lord, but you're not allowed to say, right, in Catholic religion, remember, universal church, this includes the Protestants, you're not allowed to say that there's three lords. Yeah, but how come you seem to be allowed to say it? <laughs> I mean, am I, am, I, am I just, am I offside here? Like, or are they offside? I'm going to suggest to you, they're offside. They're offside. And because they've gone here, they've created a creed of confusion. All right, we'll continue. Just as Christian truth compels us to confess each person individually as both God and Lord, so Catholic religion forbids us, sorry, I repeated that, to say that there are three gods or lords. The Father was neither made nor created nor begotten from anyone. The Son was neither made nor created. He was begotten from the Father alone. The Holy Spirit was neither made nor created nor begotten. He proceeds from the Father and the Son. And as I mentioned before, they still argue about that one. Accordingly, there is one Father, not three fathers. There is one Son, not three sons. There is one Holy Spirit, not three Holy Spirits. Nothing in this Trinity, right? And this is where, again, I'm going to repeat to you. This is where they use the term Trinity. Nothing in this Trinity is before or after. Nothing is greater or smaller. In their entirety, the three persons are co-eternal and co-equal with each other. So in everything, as was said earlier, we must worship their Trinity in their unity in their unity in their Trinity. Okay, you got to worship three and one and you got to worship one and three. <laughs> but remember, you're not allowed to say that there's three, even though we just said that there's three. <laughs> Anyone then who desires to be saved should think thus about the Trinity. And now they are attaching salvation to thinking like this about the Trinity. Well, I'm going to suggest to you that this would really should say, and I'm sorry, but I'm going to be very direct here. So please give me some grace. But this to me really should say anyone then who desires to be seriously confused should think thus about the Trinity <laughs> because I'm confused. Anyways, we'll continue. But it is necessary for eternal salvation that one also believe in the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ faithfully and see the expansion on this creed. Now, this is the true faith that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, God's son is both God and human equally. And you've heard that in your Sunday building in the Orthodox boxes. That's where they're getting this from. So you don't confess this creed, right? But they teach this one. 
He is God from the essence of the Father. That's where that comes back, begotten before time. He is human from the essence of his mother, born in time, completely God, completely human, with a rational soul and human flesh, equal to the Father as regards divinity, less than the Father as regards humanity. Although he is God and human, yet Christ is not two, but one. See? See what they're doing here? Now they got to explain this one out, right? And now we're doing the two thing. Two, we're, okay, well, even though we just said he's God and he's human, he's not two, he's still just one. You see? He is one, however, not by his divinity being turned into flesh, but by God's taking humanity to himself, he is one. Certainly not by the blending of his essence. You know, like certainly not by that. It's like, okay, why are you bringing this essence thing constantly into the mix? Well, they introduced it into the Nicene Creed and now they're blending it over here. So you are blending some creeds here. <laughs> but by the unity of his person, and they're pulling in that unity thing as listing him as God and human. For just as one human is both rational soul and flesh, so to the one Christ is both God and human. All right. He suffered for our salvation. He descended to hell. And there's that word that's already controversial in and of itself. He arose from the dead. He ascended to heaven. He is seated at the Father's right hand. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. That's a futurist position. At his coming, all people will arise bodily. And again, I'm going to suggest to you this doubles down on the physical resurrection. And I'm going to suggest strongly that that in and of itself is certainly at minimum debatable. Okay, but that's what they preach and teach. And I'm going to suggest that the scripture does not paint that picture, but rather it paints a picture of a spiritual resurrection. And this tends to now really double down on taking that thought process away. And then that opens up the door for people to say, you're a heretic and things of this nature, all based on what? An, the Athanasian Creed that most people aren't even really familiar with. And given accounting of their own deeds, those who have done good will enter eternal life. And again, I'm gonna I'm a little surprised that the uh, the Protestants that are kind of you know once saved always saved. You know, I mean, uh, you guys are like, hey, you know, it's not it's not a works based salvation. Well, according to this, it is right. If you've done good, you get to go to eternal life. That's in the Athanasian Creed. This is where they're teaching the Trinity, and this is where they're teaching a future coming of Christ that's physical and a physical resurrection. So, how come you're not complaining about this? Well. Because they, they teach one thing, but they have you confess another. Most people don't even know about this creed. I'm going to keep repeating that. And those who have done evil will enter eternal fire. And again, an implication that they're going to be remaining there, I would suggest. But uh, we'll continue anyways. Uh, this is the Catholic faith. And by the way, a little side note. Could this also be part of the reason why, you know, they don't want the entire, you know, 20,000 people or 1,000 people or 500 people saying that before they start their, <laughs> start their sermon, you know, it, could it be because it's got this kind of angst to it and kind of this threatening tone to it? Could that be why they teach it and preach it this way, but they don't have the whole congregation confess this creed? I mean, they got big screens. Why aren't you confessing this one on a weekly basis? You know, and my apologies to anyone, who, all the people who are okay, but best as I can tell in my area and the people that I've talked to, they don't do this one. They don't confess this one, but this is what they're preaching and teaching. That's what creates, I think, some confusion. This is the Catholic, which is universal Christian church faith. One cannot be saved without believing it firmly and faithfully. And I'm going to suggest to you that once again, we're seeing that tone where they're making the faith more about this creedal confession, if you will, which is all about apparently the relationship between the Father and Son and the Holy Ghost, that I don't know that they can prove much of this out of Scripture. And then in turn, if you don't believe it, boy, you're in big trouble. So, I hope this has been edifying for you guys in the sense of that I've showed you the three creeds and how the Apostles' Creed is much simpler. The Nicene Creed, in my opinion, starts to get a little bit out of bounds, right, which kind of gave place for the Athanasian Creed, which in turn, I think is really, really out of bounds. And um, I think you should know these creeds and know my position before I do the Trinity Tribulation series. It's a three-part series. So hopefully I've positioned you to understand that and given you this information. And I think this would be good if you, you know, make sure you understand these things before we enter into it. And I'm going to leave with this. Guys, I'm not against people who do want to believe the Trinity in this way. What I'm suggesting to you is it should not be fundamental to the faith because you cannot support this 
this degree of the Athanasian Creed. You can't support it in Scripture. That's my position, and I'm going to show that position. I'm not saying you can't agree with it. I'm not saying you can't believe it. it that's up to you. Okay, I'm not an absolutist and I don't slam my fists around. However, I do think you would be out of bounds if you said, and if I don't agree to this from top all the way to the bottom, then I can't call myself a Christian. I'm going to suggest to you it's this, this is not of central importance and love isn't even mentioned in this creed. And the greatest commandment isn't even mentioned in this creed. And maybe that's the problem, right? Maybe that's the problem because maybe this creed of confusion is confusing because it's a confusing creed and has very, very little to do with the love and the justice and the mercy and the grace of God. So, something to think about. I hope you'll stick around for when those uh, the Trinity series comes out and I hope you'll uh, at least allow me to present my interpretation and why I think that we should be avoiding this Athanasian creed and avoiding, quite frankly, even the Nicene creed ultimately, because it led to the Athanasian Creed from where I'm sitting. And, um, and maybe we should even talk about focusing more on the greatest commandments and um, belief in God and what Christ and what God did through Christ for us. And um, maybe not trick ourselves into thinking just because we have confessed a creed that somehow that we've done such wonderful work. All right. So hopefully we can focus more on the love of God and the mercy of God and the justice of God and the grace of God shown explicitly in Christ. So thanks guys for hanging out with me. We'll see you real soon. Remember, do all things with grace and peace.